now we come to our final panel, which of course is the panel Stordielitz. What can we do about this? Um, I don't think we quite had a panel on the Ktur Vinovat, who's guilty, although we had some of that. But now this is the panel where we're trying to look forward um, and um, uh, talk about how the United States, Europe, Ukraine, and Russia might be able to approach this crisis or find some way out of it. And we have a, um, a very distinguished panel um, who are going to discuss this, and I will just briefly uh, remind you of who they are. Uh, James Schur, in the middle there, is an associate fellow at the Russia and Eurasia program at Chatham House, uh, and he's a member of the social studies faculty uh, of Oxford University, um, which he's been for a long time, and also a visiting fellow of the Razumkov Center in Kiev, and a senior associate fellow of the Institute of Statecraft. Is that in Kiev too? No, it's in London. Oh, it's in London. Okay, all right, just checking. <laughs> um, and for a long time, he has served as um, an advisor to the UK government, to NATO, to the European Union, and some other governments. Um, and he's the author, most recently, of Hard Diplomacy and Soft Coercion, Russia's Influence Abroad, which I Should recommend which I reviewed and which I recommend highly to all of you. Uh, the next speaker will be Robert Nurek. He's a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council in Washington, DC. He's a visiting senior fellow at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, Affairs in Helsinki. Um, uh, before that, he was at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies at the Monterey Institute. Uh, of international studies. He also served as director of the Carnegie uh, Moscow Center for a number of years, and before that he was at the Rand Corporation, and he has also taught for us at Georgetown University. And our third speaker is Maxime Trudelubov, and he is, I'm just looking for this now, I don't want to say anything wrong, yes. So he's the editorial page um, editor of Vedemosti, which of course is a major independent Russian business daily. Um, and uh, he has uh, published a book in um, Me and My Country, A Common Cause in 2011. He's been a Nieman Fellow at Harvard University, and this year he is currently a fellow at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. So where we are now, just to start the panel off, is um, Russia has created new facts on the ground in Ukraine. We've been talking about them. We have a frozen conflict that seems to be um, uh, consolidating itself um, in the Donbas region. Uh, so how do we go forward? And I'm sure we're going to talk about the role of the European Union, of NATO, of the United States, of individual European countries, and of course of Russia. Um, and uh, one of the challenges I think we face, certainly in the United States, is that our attention to Ukraine is always intermittent. Um, from 2010, when Mr. Yanukovych came to power, until the Maidan events, uh, the United States was in the midst of the reset, and it essentially contracted out relations with Ukraine, with Ukraine to the European Union, uh, which was, of course, negotiating the uh, association agreement. Then the US came back in full force, but of course, we don't know how long this attention will be sustained. And for any of you, and I know my colleagues here who've already spoken, who go around the country speaking about these issues, it's often hard to make the case to Americans about why Ukraine is important. Um, I would um, question the same uh, for different European Union countries, for the European Union, what's um, you know, what are the priorities there, always recognizing that Ukraine so far has been a number one priority for Russia in recent, in recent times, particularly in the recent, in the last year, but even for longer than that, uh, and the same hasn't been true either of Europe or the, Uni or the United States. So um, on that note, um, I'd like to begin with James Shaw. Thank you, Angela, and my appreciation to Georgetown for uh, organizing this. The level of interest is highly encouraging. Uh, but you're going to be very disappointed with me. And it, it's not because I've chosen to be defiant. It's because I innocently picked up the wrong brief. That's to say, <laughs> I saw we were having a panel on domestic issues. We had a keynote address, we had another panel on energy issues, and I thought, now is the time to uh, discuss 
this from an EU, and I also, with your agreement, introducing a NATO perspective. And two-thirds of what I want to say has to do with why we're actually here, but one-third's going to be about where we're going. And my thoughts about how we're actually here, I promise you, are not going to be, uh, are not going to be a restatement of orthodoxy, uh, a questioning of orthodoxy, and I've been questioning orthodoxies for uh, a number of orthodoxies for 20 years. So I have two, I have to draw the contours of two, two intersecting triangles in 15 minutes. One is Russia, Ukraine, EU. The other is Russia, Ukraine, NATO, and I, I trust that Bob Nurek will add something to the latter. The President Putin, or acting President Putin as he was in December 1999, came to power when the Russian establishment was reaching the end of a necessary reassessment of what the EU meant to Russia's interest. And this is something I think a large number of people haven't, uh, have not really seen. In the 1990s, Russia took a very benign view of the EU because they viewed the EU primarily as a counterbalance to the United States. And that is why in 1995, when Finland joined the EU, it didn't generate any ripples in Russia at all. So even some years before the Orange Revolution in Ukraine of 2004, this assessment was changing and becoming more accurate. What was being understood by that point is that the EU fundamentally is a normative project of integration built upon norms, standards, rights, beginning with property rights, <coughs> business culture, administrative culture, political culture, profoundly at variance with the workings of the emerging Russian system. And as Putin began to construct his vertical, a system which was becoming, in modern terms, more patrimonial and more near-feudal, and this was then correctly seen as a source of tension. And once the EU embarked on enlargement, not just as tension, but a geopolitical threat of a new and insidious kind, because it was one that bore on internal arrangements more than simply external arrangements. When Russia reacted to Ukraine's Orange Revolution in 2004 by erecting, beginning to erect, um, a counter ideology based on dis the distinctive civilizational values of Russia and the East Slavic people by definition including Ukrainians, the Russians unwittingly escalated the stakes posed by EU enlargement. In essence, if a country like Estonia joins the European Union, it's irritating and annoying to Russia and not welcome, but it's not a threat. But if a people who are defined in Russia as one and the same people as the Russians, namely the Ukrainians, do so, there are direct and profound implications for the political and economic order in Russia. And that is why it seemed to me and to a few of us axiomatic that as we approached the Vilnius summit in 2013, we were heading for a train wreck. And this was aggravated by the fact that the EU has consistently refused to see itself as anything other than a normative project. You can just about get people inside the EU to accept, and I think most now do accept it, it's a normative project with geopolitical implications. But the EU is not as an entity, as an animal, accustomed to thinking in, geo, in, in, in geopolitical, let alone geostrategic terms. And therefore, did not see uh, what was coming and what I think was, uh, I would not say inevitable, but, but very, very likely. Um, the Ukrainian perspective on the EU is simpler. Uh, four, was it four now or five? Um, five Ukrainian presidents have defined Ukraine as a European state. 
There is no one inside Ukraine who argues that Ukraine is a Eurasian state. This is a major difference between Ukraine and Russia. There are those who argue that as a Slavic state, it is different from, from uh, the, the whole construction in Europe. But this was not controversial until very recently in Ukraine. NATO was an issue that polarized opinion inside Ukraine. Until recently, the issue of moving closer to the EU or joining the EU brought out some differences, but it did not bring out polarities, though obviously this began to change as it became more and more clear that the whole issue of the EU was one that could provoke a, a, a rupture with Russia. The fundamental problem all along, and it's been emphasized by every panel previously, is that Ukraine towards the EU under these different presidents was pursuing a policy which 15 years ago I called declaration by integration, uh, integration by declaration, as I say, writing programs and so on and so forth, rather than implementing, uh, implementing uh, genuine transformations in the way institutions and the economy worked. The Ukraine relationship with NATO was more straightforward, more simple, more positive, but not for the reason people expect. The, by the late 1990s, Ukraine had a unique place in NATO's external relationships, even compared to the Baltic states. This was not based on membership aspirations by Ukraine. The Ukrainian architects of this inside the armed forces and in the defense establishment were people who were very realistic, who understood that, that joining NATO would cause a crisis that they could not manage, but nevertheless were relying upon NATO primarily as an instrument of helping the country deal with this enormous burden, I don't have time to explore, of the military and security inheritance from the, uh, from the Soviet Union. Russia, on the other hand, could not view it uh, in this way. To the Russians, NATO, by definition, is an anti-Soviet, anti anti-Russian military bloc. And there was no constituency of any kind that was impressive that got above the radar that took NATO's post-Cold War transformation seriously. Because in the view of most people, unless and until NATO found a way to give Russia a place at the table and effective veto rights and de facto membership rights without, of course, the responsibilities of membership, NATO would remain an anti-Russian uh, anti military bloc. And if there was any argument, it was decided by two uh, major events. First, NATO's intervention in the Kosovo conflict in 1999. Whatever the merits of that, it was not possible for anyone anymore after that to argue that NATO is a strictly defensive reliance because Slobodan Milosevic had not attacked a NATO state. And the second issue, of course, was NATO enlargement. Um, the realities and the facts about the motives behind NATO enlargement, even for Central European states, are much more complicated. All that I need say is that NATO enlargement was accompanied by an evisceration of military capabilities in the new member states for territorial defense and for measures that would be useful against Russia, precisely because at that point it was orthodox and axiomatic in NATO that there would be no further military threats uh, from that quarter. Uh, or, or in Europe. But the Russian perception of these things is fundamentally different, and I think, as Angela said at the very outset of, um, of this conference today, when it comes to all of these issues, we are dealing with cognitive ins uh, dissonance because there is an absence of a commonality of analytical language that enable all these pieces to come together, so far at least, in, in a fairly... Uh, in a way that the various parties see as mutually beneficial. Okay, now, let me then jump ahead, if I may. Do I have five minutes? Thank you. Um, there are different but complementary narratives about what happened in the close of 2013, but let me underscore the obvious. Uh, 
Russia then and since has thundered on about the dangers of Ukraine joining NATO. This, we should not forget, this entire crisis, which began when, between Ukraine and Russia, which began under Yanukovych's presidency, not after Yanukovych's presidency, arose because of Yanukovych's determination to sign the association agreement uh, with the European Union. And although there are different testimonies from different sources in Ukraine, they all agree that effectively in the key meetings in November 2013, Yanukov uh, Putin said effectively to Yanukovych, if you sign this agreement, I will break your legs and these are the ways I will do it. Um, and you know, that, that to a large extent explains uh, what then followed because in 2013 as in 2014, the last thing that Putin was thinking of was how Ukrainian society uh, might react to Yanukovych uh, coming into compliance with all of this. Now, um, what, where might we be going? Where should we be going? Let me just let me just make two modest proposals, if I may. The first is, and uh, this will sound. Uh, I think this might be my most controversial thought of all, but I, I, I wonder if I, I, I'd be interested if anyone can contradict it. There have been, in 20 years, an endless number of blueprints about Ukrainian reform. But I don't, but if you look at all of these, they're not really blueprints for reform. What they do is illustrate what Ukraine should look like after the reform takes place. The EU, because of the kind of entity it is, I think is simply institutionally and endemically unable to do what somebody has to do. Uh, what some learned group of experienced people and practitioners and experts need to do which is to address a key question of how in Ukrainian conditions you actually begin to change the institutions so that they function in ways that begin to coincide with EU standards and practice. Meaning, you know, what institutions matter most? Which ones do you need to master first? What should be the sequence? What should be the staging? This has not been done. The Ukrainians, with all their failings, can be forgiven for being absolutely bewildered by all the advice they are given on this, none of which are practical enough to answer these fundamental questions. And I think as a matter of urgency, we must find ways of bringing key people together who can, um, who can address this. We need also constantly, as I think others have said here, to make the following point in our, in our relationship with all inter, with Ukrainian interlocutors. In the early 1990s, um, reform, that is to say, profound changes in the way institutions and the economy and the polity work was a matter of economic prosperity and a precondition for that. Over time, it gradually became a precondition for national security it is now a precondition for national survival. And the discussion about energy, I think, uh, made, this, uh, made this abundantly clear. I am still not sure that message inside Ukraine is understood. Um, I, am not, I am far from convinced that Petro Poroshenko, even though he sees himself as a reformer, understands reform in this, con in this context and in the way the EU understands it. There is a big gap that still must be, uh, must, must be uh, diminished here. And my last point, which relates to NATO, and it might surprise people. Inside NATO, as in the United States, we heard this from the Secretary, there is a consensus that we should be helping Ukraine rebuild or transform or reform its military system and defense system. But there is no strategy for doing this. There's no coherent program. In the end, we find a number of member states sending various people to be helpful with X and helpful with Y and helpful with Z. Um, 
And part of the response of the Ukrainians at this point has been to say, we don't want any more of these people because they're getting in the way of our work. So there is some serious work to be done and Ukraine is not doing it at the moment, but I would also say we are not doing it either. So on that cheerful note, I will, I will end and I will hand over to my colleague, Bob. Excuse me. Angela, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. This is a very um, uh, difficult but interesting, important set of, um, a set of topics. Uh, Angela's asked me to, to speak about U.S. policy, um, the U.S. policy response to this crisis in, in Ukraine. Now, I, I'm, I know that the people in this audience have been following this very closely. You all read the papers. You care about this. You've also just heard a presentation from Eric Rubin uh, describing how the U.S. government sees things, what it hopes to achieve, what it's done and hopes to do. Uh, and um, you've heard a lot of discussions in the other panels uh, about what are the some of the things that Ukraine needs to do uh, and, and areas where we should help. And, there's, and, and Anders provided a very good summary of, of many of those things. So I don't want to rehash all those. What I thought I would do instead is try to identify and address a, a, a selected number of what I view as sort of critical issues, critical issues in the policy agenda um, that are going to, that are either on the agenda now or soon will be, um, where there are serious debates, where there are serious uncertainties about what we will or should do, um, where there are serious challenges about the prospects for success, but where the, the resolution of which I think that is what we do or don't do, uh, where we succeed or don't, is, li or li is the resolution is likely to have serious uh, consequences uh, in the region. Um, and these concern both Ukraine uh, uh, and Russia and a set of issues cutting across them, including NATO, uh, which I'll come to at the end. But let me begin really where, uh, with one set of issues that um, where, um, where James let off, left off, and that has to do with this question of military assistance. Um, as, uh, uh, as James said, there's a lot of good talk about this. There are things being done um, uh, to, to assist the Ukrainian military. Um, uh, as Eric said, I don't see much debate about whether such assistance should continue, uh, but a lot of debate about what, and in particular, the big issue um, is this question of so-called lethal aid. That is, that is provision of, uh, of uh, defense equipment uh, armaments um, that, will, um, that would have an immediate uh, impact that one hopes um, on the situation on the ground between Ukraine and Russia. Now, I agree uh, with Eric's observation that this question of lethal aid is not the whole issue, and arguably over the medium and, and certainly the longer term, it's not even the most important one. Um, that the key is the reform of the, inst of the security institutions um, and security processes in this field uh, to provide competent, competent military, competent civilian uh, uh, oversight and control. Um, and not uh, uh, last but not, not least, um, uh, a, a healthy enough, enough economy to sustain a, a competent military over time. So the bigger issues, the underlying issues, are not defense issues. They are political and economic. But the question of lethal aid of the short, you know, both in the short term and the medium term about direct military assistance, I think cannot be ignored. Uh, first of all, because as others have said already, there's been congressional action on this, the so-called Menendez-Corker legislation, and I think it's safe to assume that the new Congress is going to make more of an issue of this, um, not less. Um, the issue, in any case, whatever is done in the immediate term is going to come up again um, uh, in time, no matter what we do in the short run, uh, because we all agree that, um, uh, that if we can put Ukraine back on its feet, uh, any serious sovereign state has the right, indeed the obligation, to its own citizens to have a competent military sector. So this question is going to come, is going to come back. Um, and finally, because I mention this, because there are, in fact, serious debates going on and disagreements in the policy community here, I think even within the administration, although obviously people don't say that in public, but one, in private discussions, one's got a strong sense of, of quite different instincts. Uh, about this. Uh, 
Um, we know it's clear that, that the administration so far has been very reluctant, um, uh, that they have resisted the pressures from the Congress and elsewhere to provide so-called lethal aid. Um, and indeed, there are some important um, uh, concerns, important arguments against doing so. And I'll just list them quickly. The, the arguments include it's impossible really to change the balance in any funda fundamental way against Russia, that uh, the military in, in Ukraine at the moment is not uh, healthy enough to assimilate uh, any new weaponry in any case, um, that because of corruption and general dysfunction, any weaponry or weaponry that we provide is likely to end up in the wrong, wrong hands, um, that, as I mentioned before, that this isn't a problem in, in any case, and last but no, no means least, that providing uh, weaponry now uh, to the Ukrainian military is going to provoke Russian escalation. Now, these are serious issues, um, and I think deserve to be taken seriously, but in my own, my own view, they're not the whole story. I do think there is a case for, um, for carefully calibrated uh, transfers of weapon weaponry in the short term. And I, I'll just list what they are. Um, first of all, although, as we've heard, the, the, the military in Ukraine uh, was in a horrendous shape um, as a legacy of the Yanukovych days. But some units now are, by all accounts, more competent and under reasonable political control. There are not a lot of them, uh, uh, but there are some, and I think there are enough of them so that if we're careful about where these things go, we would have reasonable confidence that they could be, uh, that they could be used um, to some effect and that they won't get sold to all the wrong people. Um, Secondly, I, I don't think it's the case that we don't know yet what they need. They've told us, um, and we've had, we've had teams there looking at this. Um, we, don't, we don't have the full list, uh, but we know some of the things they need in the short term, and, and uh, the, these are not mysterious. It's anti-armor weaponry. Uh, it's help with command and control, which is critical. Um, uh, there's a list of other things that they wanted too, but there are a couple of, of items like this about which I think there's general agreement both by, among Western military and defense officials who've gone to Ukraine to, to look at it and among serious competent Ukrainian officials. Um, a, third, a third consideration is that changing the fundamental balance, uh, yes, is not, is not possible, but in, in my view it's the wrong measure. Uh, it's not the issue. The issue is whether or not by, by providing some more weaponry, we can affect the calculus in the Kremlin and raise the sense of costs uh, there. I mean, we've, we've heard before uh, the, the question of, of overt Russian, further Russian military invention in Ukraine is not, is, is not an uncomplicated issue for them. It's very sensitive. They've been hiding um, the, uh, the uh, uh, casualties and deaths that have already occurred. Uh, that have already uh, already occurred, and so on and so on. Um, to the extent that we can raise a sense of costs, um, I think would be would be a useful thing to do. Um, it's going that will, it will it'll be hard to know, uh, uh, but having a few more capable units with um, good command and control, some some anti-tank weaponry and the like. Uh, it seems to me um, would be a useful thing to do. The hardest issue excuse me, for me is this question of, of escalation, whether or not providing, uh, providing weaponry would provoke Russian es escalation. Um, uh, this, is, this is, as I say, this is, this is very difficult in my view because I think it's very, it's, it's very likely that this is precisely what would happen. I certainly wouldn't plan, that it w can, uh, plan under the assumption that it won't. Uh, I just say a couple of, of things about it. One is the Ukrainians know this very well. Uh, they're the ones who run the risk, uh, and it's a risk they're willing to take, um, and I take that seriously. Uh, I would say, however, um, that e even if they're willing to take the risks, we do need, if we're going to do it, we need a plan B. That is, what is it that we're ready to do in the event that the Russians do escalate? Uh, so as I say, this, 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 this issue is not going to go away, and it's not going to be easy. A couple of other um, difficult or, I think, uh, important issues to note about policy towards Ukraine. One has to do with um, a set of issues that uh, Anders mentioned before when he called for um, uh, reform of the state. There's a particular aspect of that which I think is, has not gotten much attention and needs to, and for want of a better term, I'd call it administrative reform. Um, that is, it's going to be very important 
to do the things uh, in Ukrainian ministries and bureaucracies, to make them capable enough so that when people deal with them, they, co they come back to Washington and say, you know, this can work. And I'll, I'll give a quick story. Um, back in the 90s, I spent a lot of time when I wasn't in Ukraine with the Baltic states uh, on these issues, and the difference was striking. In the Baltic states, people went there after the fall of the Soviet Union. They found a lot of young kids um, uh, as senior officials all of a sudden, but they were smart, they were competent, they were capable, they knew what they wanted, they got things done. And people then from the US and Europe went back home uh, and said, you know what, these people are worth it. It's not just a strategic argument, but you can actually, if you, if you engage, it helps. You get things done, you can see the results. By contrast, uh, and, and, and I would say that over time what this did was to build a constituency for, for the Baltic states in Washington. Personally, I think it was one of the things, not the only one by any means, but one of the things that changed the terms of the debate about NATO membership for the Baltic states over time. And so uh, this is an important political consideration. And the contrast, unfortunately, is with Ukraine. If you've got people, both government and non-government officials, together in a room, who people who've been working with or in Ukraine in the 90s, in 10 minutes they're telling horror stories. Uh, the simple experience of working on Ukraine and with Ukrainian um, uh, uh, institutions did not create a constituency for Ukraine back here in Washington. Uh, and it's very important, I think, that that change because as we've heard over and over and over again, um, making Ukraine work is, I think, very important, but it's going to be difficult, it's going to be expensive, it's going to require a lot of patience, and to be politically sustainable in the West officials need to credibly be able to say, you know what, it's making a what we're doing is actually making a difference. It's, you know, it's hard, it's going to take time, but the trend is in the right direction. If we can't say that, I'm afraid that whatever we start with, whatever engagement we agree to now, will be very hard to sustain. One final point about, uh, about policy towards Ukraine. Again, Ukraine, again, this is an issue that's been uh, touched on by a number of people. Um, and, it's the, and it's the need for, again, for want of a better term, for some kind of a transition strategy or a transition package. What do I mean by that? If you, everyone's talked about how difficult it's going to be um, for Ukraine to put itself on its feet now. It was going to be difficult even before the Ukraine crisis. I mean, if you go, uh, there were huge challenges there. And if you go back, go back to a year ago, or go back to a year ago, September, the message of the European Union to Ukraine essentially was, look, if you do all these things we're asking you to do, uh, implement the reforms required from the, uh, entailed by the association agreement, implement the reforms that the IMF is demanding of you, in 10 years you're going to be very happy. I have no doubt that's true. The problem is in the first five years a lot of people were going to be in pain. Uh, and uh, this was especially the case in Ukraine, which was, as we've heard, was a, um, a very dysfunctional uh, government, um, especially under Yanukovych, but not starting with Yanukovych. I mention this because um, uh, it's, it, this is a lesson which I think is going to apply uh, elsewhere. If we're serious, for example, about, about re-energizing the Eastern Partnership with Moldova and Georgia, we need to think about this there too. What's a what, how do we deal with the transition difficulties? It's going to be easier there, or at least uh, these are smaller countries, so uh, at least less expensive. Um, but it's something that, that I think needs to be thought about uh, perhaps more seriously and uh, uh, more cohesively than it has been. What about Russia policy? <clears throat> well, we've, we've, had, we've already heard quite a bit about the sanctions issue. Um, like, I think, like Eric Rubin, personally, I've been pleasantly surprised by the amount of intra-Western consensus. I frankly did not expect the EU to go quite so easily um, to embrace um, and agree on the third tier of sanctions. Clearly, the, the Malaysian airliner um, incident had an impact on so, some Europeans, and, and uh, uh, the changes in German policy had a, had a very big uh, impact. Uh, and we're going to need to sustain this. Um, uh, the, the issue, one of the issues here, though, um, over time is, is, you know, is to think about, again, how we distribute, how, uh, distribute the pain involved. 
I mean, the U.S. Is, has, has been very active, and I think is in credit to the administration, has done quite a good job at mobilizing Western support for sanctions. But we all know that the costs to the U.S. are much less than the cost to a lot of Europeans. They, there's, a, there's a much more important um, and sustained uh, economic ties in a number of key European countries than the U.S. has. Uh, and over time, this may become a political difficulty. Now, the U.S. I think can make a credible case to say, well, yes, we're you know we're we're paying lower costs with respect to sanctions, but we're paying uh, paying elsewhere, including in NATO. So you know, but they're going to have to make this argument. Um, uh, and again, sus sustaining these sanctions uh, over time is going to be a matter both of of continuing to make a case for why they matter, why they're important, why they're working but also dealing with this question of, of what the sacrifices are and how they're distributed uh, among Western powers. Um, now, I think the, the larger issues and the more um, neuralgic issues um, in U.S. policy have to do with what, what it is that we want to sustain with Russia now. What, about the, what it is about the, rela the relationship that we want to sustain and what are the conditions um, under which we want to seriously re-engage. These are, uh, the first is already an issue, um, the second I think will be, and just a couple observations um, about this. It's obvious to all of us here that one thing that, that this crisis has done is it's, that Europe is back on the U.S. agenda, uh, NATO is back on the U.S. agenda, and I would argue in some ways Russia is back in, in ways that it wasn't before. Uh, even during the reset, when I, my own view of it was that this was driven very much by, uh, by instrumental uh, uh, impulses in the administration, meaning that, that uh, uh, an important set of, of uh, rationales for the reset uh, initially was the hope that Russia would help on a series of other issues that the U.S. really cared about. And I mention those because um, uh, those issues are still there. Uh, on the one hand, there's no doubt, um, if you talk to people in and out of the government, there's general agreement that policy towards Russia in, uh, needs to be rethought in a serious way. Um, but this context, the old context, still matters. It hasn't gone away. Um, there are, we, we've seen um, um, uh, the, in, the, the White House instincts, um, uh, some of which been, have been made explicit by President Obama starting at the beginning of his first term and reiterated since about what he hopes to do with, in foreign policy. And the phrase that, that they used to talk about all the time was, was strategic restra restraint. Um, uh, we've seen this before. Uh, some people talk about, uh, describe this as if it's withdrawal and isolationism. I think that overdoes it. Uh, but there, there, we've all, you know, we're very, aware, uh, very much aware of what they've said and the criticisms of what they said about how the U.S. needs to focus on what President Obama has called nation building at home. Now, this is this impulse is not new. We saw the same thing after World War II. We saw it after the Korean War. We saw it after the Vietnam War. In each time, um, in each of those cases, the world then intervened. Well, the world has intervened again. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's intervened in a context where the, some of these old impulses are still there in the administration and certainly there in parts of the Republican Party, not on their own terms, but because of their very strong arguments about fiscal restraint. This is going to be a very big issue when we get to, uh, get to dealing with, for example, aid packages for Ukraine. So that's not going to go away. Fine. In addition, there are other issues um, which remain on the agenda, including these issues which I referred to before that, that, ha that were, I think, central to the, to the reset. The hopes for that, that Russia will be helpful on Iran, on North Korea, on, on Syria, and so on. Um, these still absorb time, um, including in some cases but in the Defense Department, um, and uh, some of them are quite neuralgic still. And we've seen recently, um, again, in, in at least uh, public statements by both U.S. and Russian officials about the need to return to those, to try to find them. The, the, the recent me um, meeting of Secretary Kerry and Minister Lavrov, um, the press, if, you, if you looked at the press conference statements um, afterwards, they were saying, well, yes, we talked about Ukraine, and yes, we have our difficulties, but we spent most of our time talking about other things where we have common interests. 
This is going to be, again, these, this, is, this is on the one hand, it's, it's an instinct that, um, uh, to, to try to look at these other issues, to try to sustain cooperation where we can. That's going to be very powerful in this administration. Uh, it will probably return to the next one, um, although maybe not immediately. And it's going to be very controversial. What are the conditions under which we do it and about what? Um, a couple of final points. Um, one is um, uh, an issue that's not directly about, um, about Russia policy, but is going to have an impact uh, on, um, on, I think, the thinking there, as well as el elsewhere, and that is how NATO, NATO itself responds to this crisis. Uh, there is a new issue here. I mean, we, we, you're all familiar with the so-called reassurance packages that have been agreed. Um, the, what came out of the Wales summit, uh, uh, which um, in my, at least my own discussions with Poles and Balts in general, although they didn't get everything they wanted, in general they're quite happy with, uh, with, uh, with the outcome of that summit, provided they get implemented. But there's one big issue for NATO, and um, which, which will get us back to this question of, of, how to, of whether and how we can deter for further Russian adventurism in Ukraine, um, and that is how to deal with what some called the little green men, but that's, that's really not the issue of, uh, it's of asymmetrical warfare. Um, this is a particular style of warfare which, which um, Russian military thinkers starting um, with some very senior ones have been writing about recently. Um, it involves a combination of, <coughs> excuse me, of, of cyber, of information operations, of attempts to foment instability domestically with military force, overt military force, sort of looming in the background as a potential threat. And I, I, I mention um, this last point, looming in the background, because the, the purpose of it is precisely to make it unclear uh, whether this is a domestic a problem of domestic instability or an imminent invasion. Um, this is, uh, dealing with this raises a set of issues that NATO has not addressed before. What is it in particular that NATO should do if it's not clear whether the Article 5 uh, commitment is relevant or not? NATO is very clear. If this is a domestic problem, it's not NATO's responsibility. It's a national, it's a national responsibility. But the, the line between what is, a, you know, what is a national incident and what is now an international one where there may be direct invasion is much blurrier than it used to be. Dealing with it is going to involve, uh, is going to involve a, attention not so much to military issues, although those are some, but an awful lot about the intersection between civilian and military authorities, both at the national level, between nations, uh, and, and NATO itself. Um, Finally, just one, what's the bottom line to all this? One of the things that, that I think many of my Russian interlocutors do not understand is, is, or do not fully appreciate, is the impact that this has had on the thinking uh, in Washington about what's desirable and what's possible in the relationship with Russia and why. Part of it, obviously, an important part of it is what Russia has done. But another important part of it is the simple fact, to be blunt about it, that Mr. Putin and people around him have been lying through their teeth about it. Um, and uh, this has made a big difference, too, because this is a cliche, but the, 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 the effect this has had on trust is going to be a constraint about, um, on, I think, on U.S. policy as long as Putin's there. Any initiatives that are considered seriously are going to run up against the question, well, does do the successful implementation of these things require that we believe what they tell us? Uh, uh, the bottom line is I think they're, you know, we're, going to, we're going to try to sustain some things and should. There will be areas where, it'll, where people will want to re-engage on some issues. But what I expect is it's very hard for me to see, imagine this administration or the next one, whatever its character, um, investing a lot of time, energy, political capital into this relationship um, beyond a very narrow, fairly narrow agenda as long as Putin is there. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm, it's uh, the first time I'm here. It's a beautiful place. And uh, uh, I'm a media person. I'm a journalist uh, from Moscow. I've uh, actually been uh, one of the editors of uh, Verdomosti 
daily, uh, which has been around for 15 years. We've just marked 15 years um, this year. And uh, it so happens that uh, we started uh, in September in 1999. It was almost exactly the time when Vladimir Putin can, came, came to power, became a, a first prime minister, then very soon president. And uh, we sort of lived together for all the, the, those years and been watching the process, um, uh, watching how it all developed. And um, I'm going to speak through the prism, through the <coughs> eyes of, uh, of a media person. We, we, I'm, I'm looking through media, and I think it's not, uh, it, it actually makes sense because what we've been seeing uh, for roughly 14 years at home domestically in Russia sort of spilled over in the world, and we see more and more of uh, a Russian uh, uh, but sort of participation on the world scene, on the international scene, including <coughs> through media. Uh, there have been more investment, uh, more active position on many fronts. So I will try and go through the points I think are telling, points uh, that are the result of um, this long experience working in Russia, um, doing things that are different from the things that uh, the Russian official uh, government position is uh, on what is media. We've been doing different. Um, uh, so, but uh, inevitably, I've accumulated a number of observations of how it works, and then I will come with some conclusions which I think are also important for Ukraine and for international position on, um, on this Russian-Ukrainian uh, international, actually, crisis that's been um, evolving for the past uh, months. So what's important, I think, point one, is <clears throat> that Mm. Any, uh, any autonomous institution, uh, autonomous institutions, any autonomy is an enemy for the Kremlin. It's, um, it's something that's impossible. It, uh, it cannot really exist. They don't understand it. And independent media is one of those things. They don't, they don't understand independent courts, don't understand political parties, uh, NGOs, uh, organizations of various kinds. And um, what follows is that um, you have to deal with, with this. You have to somehow rule media. And um, it emerges very soon that owners are the mechanism of, 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 of how you deal with media, how the Kremlin deals with media. Basically, owners equal editors in, in their understanding of uh, things. Uh, it's, it's this phrase that uh, <clears throat> President Putin himself loves to quote very often, uh, he who pays the piper calls the tune. Uh, and uh, that's how he, at least what he says he thinks uh, about media. Uh, media is not really a business, for example. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually an agenda setting tool. And uh, if it's a media owned by a foreign company, then um, those foreign owners are extensions of foreign governments. So um, the Kremlin's relationship with media is relationship actually with owners. So they, they control media through owners, and um, that's, where they, that's the way they see it. That's, that's how it should be. They don't understand why it should be, you know, any, any, any other way. Um, and so control is paramount. Uh, in Russia, we have we've seen for the past 15 years steadily, but surely that uh, the Kremlin has been building control over the most, uh, the, sort of the biggest uh, media, um, especially by audience reach, which is obviously important. So by now they have control over the 
five biggest um, TV channels and um, by audience reach. And uh, right now, they <coughs> apparently, we are seeing that they are going after some other media that previously were considered sort of less important and probably there was this theory of um, small window that um, they intention intentionally left for uh, sort of the small parts of uh, the population who are actually interested in any independent news or uh, second opinions, alternative points of view, etc. And uh, it seems that um, it's no longer the case. They are uh, right now going after um, media that's been long considered uh, sort of uh, allowed to exist in Russia. Um, and that includes our newspaper, but I, I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not going to this because it's like, it's, uh, it's not over yet, it's the story is evolving, so it's really not the time to comment on that. Um, what's important, I think, is that um, um, it's the kind of vision that you can, through, through the Kremlin's attitude towards media, you can, you can build a certain picture of how they view the world, what, was, what, what they think. And um, they obviously think that um, influence is uh, some kind of a commodity. Influence, you can buy influence. Uh, I mean, as always with, with, with this kind of views, I mean, there's always half truth to that. I mean, you obviously can invest in, in, uh, in media and get more influence. Uh, but they sort of bring it to some real level of, uh, I think, to the very high level of the absurd, but um, they do invest in media more and more, and we are seeing a lot of uh, money going into state-owned media, including uh, international uh, broadcasting in uh, uh, many languages. They now broadcast not just in English, uh, but also in German and Spanish, and um, the amount of money that goes into, into this has grown despite the obvious uh, budgetary constraints uh, Russia is facing, this actually has grown. And uh, for example, for the year um, uh, 2015, uh, the amount of um, allocation for uh, RT, so the, the, the channel is formerly known as Russia today, I think they call themselves RT now, uh, they've, um, it, it's growing to 400 million. Uh, for the uh, just to compare, it's uh, roughly the amount um, the Corporation for Public Group Broadcasting in the United States is allocated uh, yearly, and 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 they split it between different things. As I understand it, they give it to different uh, radio programs and uh, uh, various uh, projects on uh, public radio, etc. The sort of the values that grow out of this are interesting, I think, and they've been really common. That that's been really uh, the kind of life we've seen um, for the past 15 years in Russia. Um, I will try to summarize a few of uh, sort of the, the kind of values that you inevitably deal with uh, being a you know media person in Russia. Uh, truth is relative. That's very important. Uh, truth is not a constant. And it's been mentioned actually here, uh, things like, um, uh, I think uh, Eric Rubin said that, that the United States is viewed as a mm, sort of as a big country. Oh, I mean, sometimes it's like laughable, funny, and uh, uh, they, they like to poke fun at certain Figures, especially press, mm, uh, press people at the White House, uh, sort of like stupid, you know, really uh, weird people running the show. And then the other, the next second, it's the the big country that's ruling the world, pushing everyone around, including Russia. Um, Ukraine, like another example. Ukraine is not a state, but on the other hand, uh, Ukrainian state is very repressive. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, it goes on and on. I mean, uh, even towards the attitudes towards Russian, R R Russia's own history, um, 
for example, the Russian Revolution of 1917 is a bad thing. It's been presented continuously as a, uh, as, um, as a result of national treason, basically. It's uh, the people who have, um, they robbed Russia of, the, the, of, of its victory in the, uh, the First World War, in the Great War. But then, on the other hand, um, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the biggest tragedy. And, uh, and the, I mean, the Soviet Union grew out of the revolution. And uh, you kind of, when you connect the two, you don't know where it starts and where it ends. And, but it's like the discrepancy is normal. Uh, it's sort of it's, it's it's not supposed to be questioned. The things they they're, they're really emotional. They don't, they don't. There's no logic. The next point is that truth is not just relative. It's actually unknowable. Mm, it, there's no such thing actually. And uh, to this end, to to show, to prove it, uh, the Russian audience is subjected to um, entertainment. Like the channels are, f f uh, are filled with various weird talk shows and shows that are full of very strange and not really funny stuff. But that's um, which is obviously by any means uh, not a phenomenon unique to Russia. But in Russia, uh, it's, it's sort of supplemented by sort of a certain, again, set of values or anti-values that uh, there are no facts. There's always only a commentary, an interpretation. The interpretation rules. Uh, you'll see a lot of interpretation. It's actually mm, the programs that were supposed to be like more or less news analysis. They are. They actually are all commentary. It's the victory of opinion in a strange and twisted way. There are lots of conspiracy thinking, conspiracy theories. Pseudoscience, like everywhere, you're subjected to all kinds of weird stories of how you can treat this or that, um, you know, ill, Ill or sickness and something, and it's like numerous programs uh, uh, advertising questionable medicines, really sort of something either postmodern or actually medieval. Uh, it, it's it's really, I mean, w listening even to programs that are considered sort of quality press, including the few remaining uh, free radio stations. You're always, when I listen to it, I just, I marvel at how impossible this all sounds, but still it's there. Um, and um, this is uh, part of, yeah, and, and public, I think this is also an important thing, another point. Public speaking for public, official, pub, public officials is a ruse. You're not supposed to get um, any any clues as to what's going to what what this public policy is going to be. It's supposed to be a ruse. And um, I mean, it's been like this for for years and years and years. More than 10 years ago, the officials, the Russian officials, would say that they won't, for example, just one example, that they won't bankrupt the company, the old company, Yukos, which was a uh, scandal many years ago, more than 10 years ago. But then uh, they, that's exactly what they did almost the next day. And um, right now, with when all this is happening on the international stage, we, we know that Putin said that uh, he won't, he, this, Russia doesn't need to annex Crimea. Uh, it's sort of out of the question, but then very soon, that's exactly what is done. And um, it's not like there is no discrepancy. They don't see it as a problem. It's uh, legitimate because uh, it's the war mentality. That's what it is. Uh, Russian media uh, actually have been in, this, in the state of war for quite a long time. Months, but actually I think more than that, for years. It's just 
I mean, the tension heightened for the past, uh, well, roughly almost a year by now. Well, it's November, right? Actually, a year. Yeah, I'm actually very close to conclude. So uh, they're waging a war, sort of a media war. Uh, uh, and, um, and hence all this imagery of war and, um, and the, the sort of the, they're actually not just, it's not just an abstract war, the, the imagery used is usually the images of the Second World War that is known in Russia as the Great Patriotic War. And those are images that everyone knows from their childhood, that's why they're very powerful. And um, so the audience finds itself in sort of in a textbook uh, where ours, our people, our good soldiers are fighting some bad uh, guys. And that sort of that speaks to people's hearts. It's, it's like easy, it's very emotional and it's very efficient apparently. But um, what I think it is, and it's like I'm, when I'm trying to think about it, why is this? what they're actually doing. Uh, I think that this is this war mentality and this is, you know, truth is relative, truth is unknowable. Uh, all this um, is uh, the result of uh, profound disillusionment in, um, in um, actually in Russia itself, in a way, in Russia's ability to transform, to reform itself. Um, they went, I mean, all of those people who are governing Russia right now, and we, the, the important thing to keep in mind is that this is one generation. It's a relatively new country. Though, th those people have been in charge since early 90s, and they're still there. So whatever country's been through, they've been through. And um, I think my understanding is that what happened to them is that they realized um, maybe in the 90s, maybe in the early 2000s, maybe it was the result of all those relationships with the West uh, when um, the expectations were not really met. Um, they've realized that it's like, it's useless. It's, it's, it's not going to work. Um, I mean, obviously, on, in, publicly, they always blame the West. But I think deep back in their minds, they know that it's not just the West. Probably mm, they also made mistakes and they probably are to blame themselves, but they're still in control. And um, they sort of, and they're not gonna, they don't think they're gonna, they don't want to, to go away. Uh, and um, actually when the things they say about, yeah, I'm, I'm wrapping up, uh, things they say about Ukraine uh, very often are things that they can, cannot publicly say about Russia itself. You know, all those things like corruption, nationalism, you name it, uh, a lot of it. And um, uh, what they do, uh, historian Tim Snyder called applied postmodernism. I think it's like pretty much the, the case. Um, and I mean, there are lots of people, including those who used to run Russian domestic politics, who sort of are really into modern art, contemporary art, and all that stuff. Uh, but what's important for the, our story here, for Russia, Ukraine, and the West, is that uh, what, you, what, what the, sort of the goals, the, the tasks that Ukraine is facing are actually sort of um, could be described as applied modernism, not postmodernism, but modernism. Because what Ukraine needs are very basic stuff. Uh, Ukraine needs modern state, a rule of law, accountability, you know, these simple things that Russia never actually got. And I think that part, the, the part of Russia's elite, Russian elite's disillusionment is, is the fact that they never, they were never able to achieve that and that's why they're saying that it's like all wrong and uh, imposed on them by the West. And, um, but this is exactly what Ukraine has to do. 
And I don't think you can somehow sidestep these things. You actually need to do them. And it's like big. Uh, and uh, it requires uh, it requires a lot of energy. I mean, it requires beliefs, actually. And it requires exactly the opposite things. Uh, Russia descended into mentally. This mentality that Russia has right now in the, I mean, Russia meaning the, the people who are running media, running the government, the mentality of sort of everything is relative, there's no, nothing is true. Everything is possible, as uh, Peter Pomerantsev, I think, quite felicitously called his book. So that's exactly what Ukraine shouldn't do. Um, and it's sort of difficult because, because of the sheer uh, the scale of of, uh, of the task. It, you, you actually have to be positive, and you have to have beliefs. You know, have to do real things, not those postmodern things. And postmodern things are actually easier to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, we've had uh, three terrific presentations. Um, I'm sure there are questions. So um, why don't we start off here? Thank you very much, and thanks for three excellent uh, presentations. I'd just like to come back uh, to a couple of the points that James uh, made. I agree completely about the uh, narrative that Putin has developed and uh, the influence of the events in the Balkans in 1999. Um, I think at moments we have played into this narrative. Um, the, the vision of uh, encroachment through successive waves of NATO and uh, EU enlargement. I don't think it's only for propaganda purposes. I think it's partly um, believed. And some of the events around um, the Vilni Vilnius summit and uh, the Maidan, I think, played into that. Um, obviously, the vision of the sort of Nazi revolution, hugely and vastly and deliberately exaggerated, but the sight of EU leaders going down into the Maidan, joining arms with uh, various uh, armed demonstrators, I don't think they knew in every case with whom they were joining arms, comments by senior American diplomats and so on, in which the EU didn't come off too nicely either. I think... Um, <laughs> we won't oh, record them You know, I mean, I think all of this played into this narrative, and I think that this narrative does have a power of its own in the further developments extremely briefly uh, on the EU. I think what people tend to forget sometimes is that the EU put forward this whole neighborhood policy association agreement approach and so on to stop Ukraine from applying for membership. Um, I mean, uh, Poland and uh, Sweden at times might have seen it rather differently, but really after Poland's accession, the big enlargement of 2004, the fear was another wave of enlargement that the EU just wasn't ready for. And if that was true then, it's almost even more true now with the Euro crisis still going on and so on. Um, I don't think that um, Yanukovych was, uh, had taken the decision to sign. Um, I think he wanted to play off both sides. I think Ukrainian uh, oligarchs didn't want to be part of the transparency of the EU market or of the customs union, and uh, that, they were, that, that he was uh, balancing between the two. Let's not forget the inordinate time spent on the Timoshenko affair um, and how that must have echoed also with Yanukovych and also the financial situation in which Ukraine found itself around the time of Vilnius and the fact that the EU wasn't able uh, to respond to that. Finally, I think from now on, it's not so much a question of the EU not being able to support the necessary reforms and so on. I think the key issue is whether Ukraine itself and its new government will be determined to make those reforms. Just to recall, in Poland and in Central Europe, the really drastic and draconian reforms were made four years before the EU offered any kind of membership perspective. So I think the burden of responsibility is on the new Ukrainian government and the EU will support, but the sad truth of the matter is that most EU countries do not see the same degree of interest in Ukraine as Putin obviously does. And therefore, the amount of support likely to be forthcoming, alas, will maybe be less than is required. Thank you. Do you want to comment on that? Yes. In, in 90 seconds, let me make four comments. First, I agree with 90% of what you've said. Given the system that Putin was constructing at home, I do not think that his response to the challenge posed by European enlargement 
was paranoia. Uh, this tension was inbuilt, and he magnified it, and so there was a real, there is a real issue, point one. Number two, my perception, which obviously one must discuss, is that Yanukovych firmly intended to sign, but not to implement. And all the advice around him suggested, no, you don't have to implement. The EU has a geopolitical interest in all of this, and uh, you know, a certain amount of the usual imitation and virtual measures uh, will suffice. I think the deeper issue, which existed then, but which still exists now and is very relevant going forward, is that there is still, in many quarters of the EU, a belief which is founded on hope more than experience that we, at some level with Russia, share a common interest in the common neighborhood. I do not think this leadership in Russia does share a common interest with us, and I do not think they will as long as they are in power. Uh, as Yanukovych was tottering, uh, I think Putin's clear view was, if I cannot subordinate Ukraine, I will wreck it. He's not going to be able to resubordinate it, but so far he's doing a good job in wrecking it. And this is the challenge we're facing, and we're not going to be able to face it very well if we believe that there is going to be an acceptable solution that, that Russia is going to accept, something else, uh, something else will have to change. Right. Um, I would also add, just to your point about EU officials, I think one can also question the wisdom of American officials in November going into the Maidan and joining the demonstrators. I mean, because it feeds again into this narrative that's already um, sort of there, sotto voce, and then it becomes much louder. Did you want to add yeah, sure. anything to that? No. Question over here. A question for James, and, and I welcome remarks from the rest of the panel, including Angela. Um, it, it, James, I entirely agree with you that there is no roadmap for reform uh, in, in terms of action steps uh, in, in Ukraine, and the lack of coordination among Western countries on assistance programs to, to Ukraine. Where would you expect that leadership in the West to come from? Or where should it come from? Is it Washington? Is it Brussels? Is it major European capitals? Where would you, would need to come from? I cannot answer that. What I think we need before we answer that is a recognition that we, and I think I'm saying this reinforcing the points that Bob has made, we in the West, it's not just Europe, we have an addiction to silver bullets. Um, I fully agree with Bob, for example, when he says that if you just add weapons to the current force structure in Ukraine, you're not going to solve a problem. If, I don't care if we have level three sanctions against Russia or level six, if the Russian perception is they will disappear by next July, at least the ones, the only ones they worry about, which uh, I think are in the energy sector, uh, if they're going to disappear by next July, we will tough it out. Now, um, it, it, if you understand that the fundamental problem is to create incentives and restraints that oblige Russian power structures to conclude that their current policy is damaging their fundamental interests, those who understand that will realize, you know, we do, we do need a strategy. The person who has the clearest understanding of it is Angela Merkel, but she, everyone will tell you she's no strategist. Uh, with all respect to the current occupant of the White House, I don't think he is one. So I can't answer the question, Edward, but, but that I'll, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it at that, and maybe you can answer it. <laughs> uh, ju just a few words. I mean, <laughs> I think I know where I'd like to see this happen. Um, that's uh, quite different from where I think it will yeah. happen. I mean, uh, and there are various aspects to it. I mean, one part is some process for very serious U.S.-EU collaboration, particularly on, 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 um, on economic assistance. And, and one of the things, one of the reasons is, is, the, is the point I made before about the need to, to think hard about Given the fact that the kind of aid, uh, the, the levels and, 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 and types of financial and other assistance that we're going we're gonna to provide Ukraine are larger than they would, were, would have been a year ago, they're still going to be a lot less than the Ukrainians think they need and arguably uh, that they do. Um, so I, one, one important part of it would be to look at this transition problem. That is to think hard about 
where this, where this assistance makes the biggest economic difference, but also the biggest political difference. Pr gas prices are one, but, but uh, there are others. And I think one area to think hard about is, has to do, for example, the effects on Donbass industries and for thinking about further integration. This is an issue, I talked about the EU, but this is also an issue for the US if the US is serious about it. Um, on some other issues, there's a real need um, for serious um, EU-NATO collaboration, precisely because the, the new defense issues cut across military and civilian boundaries and, um, and, and importantly engage areas where the EU has much more authority and responsibility than NATO does or should. So, you know, it varies a bit, but those are two that come immediately to mind. Other questions here? Patrick Bell, uh, FIU. Uh, uh, I guess it's for all the panelists, but especially uh, Mr. Nurek. I appreciate your um, focus on administrative reform um, as a specialist in comparative uh, administration that has actually worked with some administrators in Ukraine. I will definitely tell you it's a fly by the seat of your pants kind of place. And I think the thing that's important in that regard is that I've met many Euro Ukrainian public administrators. They don't lack for heart, but they lack for experience, they lack for knowledge. And I think what happens is that when you have um, such a paucity of experience to draw from, it becomes very easy to be swayed. And I think that's what happens sometimes, is that they decide that somebody tells them, this is your silver bullet, or this is your silver bullet, this is what we need to do, and then they implement it, and then it goes awry, and then afterwards people wonder why. So I think that that's one thing that I, I would personally think is less controversial. If we want to provide aid to Ukraine, we need to provide specialists that work on nuts and bolts issues, not just tax reform, but municipal, you know, government reform, you know, what it really means to operate a permit system, for example, with the, um, you know, with the real estate. Um, I guess my question for the rest of the panel is this, um, how can we take this away from a strictly, I would say, zero-sum game that says whatever, you know, we do in the West is going to hurt Russia, whatever Russia does to us is going to hurt the U.S. I don't think that's the case. I think that's like the very, that's like the opposite of the way it should be. So how can we get away from this bipolarity and try to, you know, implement something that will actually help, you know, Ukraine in the short term, as opposed to just, you know, writing them a big blank check? Do you want to start? Well, let me, let me start on, on the administrative reform question. I very much agree with, with um, your suggestion. There's, it's, this is not sexy. Uh, but it's, it's, it's important and getting the nuts and bolts right. Um, uh, my own experience personally has been, uh, was, has been largely with the defense ministry and there we've all talked about one big problem is corruption, but it's not the only problem. Um, there are plenty of perfectly capable people there at mid-levels, but they have no authority. The authority is the other problem, is that everything, the most mundane sorts of issues had to go up to the top. Um, they could take six to eight months to get resolved. Um, the process was completely opaque. You never knew what was going to happen, and when you got a decision, you never knew why. Um, and uh, it, it became, that's one of the reasons it was so very difficult to get things done, even when everybody agreed that it was used, worth doing. So having a, a structure in which uh, there are, you know, the, the guidelines, the, 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 um, the general policies are set at the top, but where people below them have have clear guidance about what they can, what, about the authorities that they have to implement things um, is another critical aspect. And, and as I agree, a lot of this is going to be just simple nuts and bolts issues on some of the key administrative issues. And I, 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 just to reiterate what I said before is that I think it's important precisely to sustain political support back home so that when people go back they can say, you know, it's hard, it's difficult, it's expensive, but slowly it's when we do things, actually things happen. And the trend, however hard, is in the right direction. Okay. The zero sum game should not be our game. That is to say, our purposes in helping Ukraine must not be to damage Russia. But the fact that Russians perceive them that way is not only something we can't do anything about, we have to be very hard nosed about this. It's Russia's problem. Carrying out the 
uh, recommendations and developing the, the, the priorities of the NATO Newport Summit it, to reassure and defend new neighbors is also should not be designed to hurt Russia, let alone for regime change. But we cannot control how this leadership in Russia is going to see it. We have to avoid two pitfalls. First, we have to avoid so much of what went wrong in the 1990s, which is this itch to interfere and make things better inside Russia. We don't know how to do that very well. It's not our it's not our business. But we cannot, at the same time, tiptoe around the domestic requirements of the system that Putin created. We have our own interests. Our job is to act in our national interests and let Russia act in its national interests and see if we can talk about these things in a rational, in a rational manner, which is not impossible. Maxime, can we help Ukraine without immediately that being seen as a threat in Russia? Well, um, uh, it's a, uh, I think um, um, you just, I mean, Ukraine needs a lot of assistance, a lot, including a lot of just, no, money, just, you know, help to pay for things. And uh, if, if, if the West will be able to provide that, some real aid, real um, projects on the ground that everyone will be, uh, that Ukraine will be able to to show, like to, to demonstrate that they've done this, that would be enormous. And, uh, and that will gradually build a new kind of relationship with Russia as well, because uh, I mean, this will help create that same reality, that, that thing, the reality on the ground that Russia actually understands, the Kremlin, I mean, understands very well things, actual things happening, mm -hmm. very powerful. So uh, I think it's just simple. Uh, and, and it's not, I, I totally understand it's not simple from the Western point of view, because I don't think Ukraine is the, like the, the biggest priority uh, for uh, this country, uh, in, even not for many countries in Europe. So Maxime, may I just add something? Ukraine might not be. But the fundamental issue, as, uh, as Eric Rubin said, for us, which is our priority, is maintaining the system of security in Europe and the treaty regimes of Europe. And when it comes to that, we have at least as fundamental an interest as Russia have, has. And that has to be the response when President Putin says to us, Ukraine is more important than for us than it is for you. The basic issue for us goes well beyond Ukraine. That's okay, and we are just, running out of time. Sorry. sorry. Um, uh, we have, so maybe I'll take a couple of questions. Keith over here. Yeah, yeah Keith Darden. Uh, you know, the part of the discussion today has led me to think that we cannot help Ukraine. <laughs> and the assumption seems to be that aid will help them. But in many ways, it's like giving heroin to a heroin addict. And it's what fuels the existing pathology is that they've gotten aid in one form or another, either from the Russians through corrupt gas deals or by us paying their bills that allow them to rob their own state. And I'm wondering, what are the negative effects in your minds of actually cutting them off? No military aid no economic aid, because in many ways, not having a Ukraine is, is less, uh, in many ways, less of a problem than having the dysfunctional Ukraine that we've had and continues to be this kind of hole in Europe. Uh, just putting that out as a provocative <laughs> position. So you're basically saying what Vladimir Putin apparently suggested uh, to Poland some time ago, that we redivide Ukraine between Poland and Russia, right? Yes, yes. Um, OK, and I think the last question over there. Yeah. <laughs> well, mine is really a companion question to his. Uh, you appear to be saying that none of the aid that Ukraine has received, technical assistance, water projects, et cetera, over the past 20 years has had any effect. Uh, is that what you believe? OK, final point for the two of you. <laughs> Can we assist Ukraine? Should we assist Ukraine? Um, 
uh, Keith was thinking the unthinkable. And you know, one should have a mature and considered response to this, but we don't have time. So <laughs> what I would just say in response is if I think, if, if for some reason uh, we, whoever we is, adopted this course, we would find ourselves without the, w not having an EU or NATO either because such a radical change of course would provoke such discord about fundamental matters uh, that Western cohesion would, would, simply, uh, would simply break up. And I have to say, as someone who's worked inside Ukraine and shared the frustrations of, uh, of everyone, uh, it is um, absolutely, in my view, not the case that assistance, which I measure not simply in, in financial terms, but in intellectual and institutional terms, that it has not done anything. There is a range and level and depth of uh, understanding, even in some quarters, sophistication in Ukraine, which simply did not exist uh, 20 years ago. And it does not mean at all that our approach should stay uh, as it is. And I just have to reiterate, instead of giving Ukrainians a 2,500-page blueprint, we have to now start talking about 25 pages in which we make it clear to the key players, if you want this from us, this is what we expect you to do, and if you have good reasons not to do it, let's sit around a table and discuss them. But anyway, I won't go further. We don't have time to. Thanks. Well, we have just, the last word. Just very quickly. I mean, uh, yes, the, it, is, it is the case that engagement with Ukraine, aid to Ukraine, uh, before has been a source of frustration, as I mentioned before. Um, but I would not say that it's been utterly without without effect. It has, in some case, it's it's been it's been very difficult. It, um, it's been hard to su hard to sustain here, precisely because of the pathologies there. Um, but there have been cases, and I've seen them in the defense ministry, but also elsewhere, where it, where it has had an impact. Some of those, some of the positive effects have, were undone um, uh, later on, including by Mr. Yanukovych. Um, the, the problems didn't start with him, but um, uh, un, he certainly made a lot of them worse and, and erased some of the uh, some of the effects, which were at le which were beginning to look more hopeful. So, it's I don't think it's the case um, that it has made uh, that it has made or would make now um, uh, any useful uh, impact. Um, uh, indeed, for the reasons that people said before, if there's any time where it could, it's now simply because. Um, they've got a very different different government. They've got a parliament, um, which at least on, on on paper is ready to support it, uh, uh, and and so on. It's going to be uh, again. It's going to be very difficult. And this gets to, gets to, to Keith's question. It may be that we have to face that. That even if we try, um, we can't sustain it. It's too hard. It's too expensive. It's too frustrating. That's very possible. Uh, uh, I don't want to start there because I do think that simply abandoning Ukraine at this point um, um, it will lead to results which I think will be very, very un unpalatable. Part of it is just instability in the region. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to talk about dividing up Ukraine to Poland and Russia. This will not be a peaceful process, no. um, uh, to say the least. It also, I mean, this is a much bigger subject as uh, as. Uh, as James indicated, it's going to have effects on our policies elsewhere and the credibility of them. And people are already looking at this. Um, talk to the Japanese exactly. um, and, and others. I mean, about, you know, we, we have made, for better or worse, we have made very strong rhetorical commitments to Ukraine. And people are either going to take the, these and other ones seriously or not. We've already had a problem because of the Budapest Memorandum. Um, which was meant basically to trade commitment to territorial integrity, no use of force for Ukraine giving up nuclear weapons. Well, um, we've started to hear some blowback about that from in other non-proliferation areas. Um, you know, basically saying, should we help, should we trust the security assurances you give us if we do the things you ask us to do? So I, these are there are a whole set of issues like that. I just assume not not face if we don't have to. Well, on that very somber note, I do would like, would very much like to thank my team at Ceres for organizing this conference, for doing such a great job. Uh, I'm going to name them too. Benjamin Loring, 
Christina Watts, Eugene Imus, and Everett Gutierrez. So thank you very much. Thanks to Chevron. Thanks to the audience, the panelists, for um, a very good conference. And obviously, since there's so many unanswered questions, we need to have another one in the not too distant future to continue discussing the way forward. Thank you. Thank you.